And today we're going to talk about death because, uh, by golly, it's in the air. <laughs> so, hi, Sean. Hey. I know this is a heavy subject, but we've got to talk about it. It is. It is a very heavy subject, and uh, let me start by saying, uh, you know, it's not our intention here to uh, disturb anyone's um, viewpoint or if, if they're comforted by uh, certain beliefs and theologies. Uh, you know, we're not out to uh, ruin anyone anyone's uh, theology here. Uh, we just want to come to an understanding of what the Bible teaches on the subject of uh, what happens when people die and uh, base our beliefs on what the Bible says uh, because the Bible has the authority of God behind it as opposed to um, other books out there that uh, are just someone's opinion uh, on a various subjects. So what we may say uh, will probably disagree with uh, mainstream Christianity and mainstream Hinduism and mainstream uh, Islam and uh, even modern Judaism, yeah. uh, but it's still what the Bible teaches, and we give it only the authority that the Bible does, which is God's authority. Mm -hmm. So uh, with that disclaimer, I'd like to, to start by talking about um, a, a book that I came across and in looking into this subject, which I wanted to recommend to your listeners. It's by a, uh, a Baptist pastor called Warren Prestige, uh, who lives in New Zealand. And uh, it's called Life, Death, and Destiny by Warren Prestige. And uh, you can, I'm sure, find that off the Internet these days. It's pretty easy to find books. And uh, I'm going to be quoting from his book as well as some other sources um, as it relates to some of the historical information outside of the Bible. But I do want the majority of our conversation to be focused on, um, you know, at least at, in the beginning, what does the Bible say about this subject? But uh, to start off, uh, Warren, uh, he states this in his book on uh, page 8. He says, Fear of death is not quite like other fears. Of all the feelings in the hearts of men, fear of death is the most tenacious. Some leading modern philosophers suggest that it is our awareness of impending death which largely determines our lives by inducing a persistent, deep-seated anxiety. And so death is a very serious subject. And uh, I remember as a little boy, uh, late one night, it's such a bizarre memory, I just remember it so well. I was on the top bunk, and I was lying there thinking about death and what death would be like. And so I had my eyes closed, and it was all dark. And so I thought to myself, well, this is, this is sort of what death would be like. You know, you just would, uh, it would everything would just be, be dark. And then I started really contemplating it and meditating on it, and I, and, I, and I realized that I wouldn't be there to see that it was dark. That death would be the total annihilation or extinction of my existence, that I wouldn't... The cessation of your senses. Say that again. The cessation of your yes. senses. Yes, the cessation of my senses. So I wouldn't even be there to experience death, because I would not be... And so, as I was thinking about it, it really scared me, so I ran into my parents' bedroom and crawled into bed with them. Um, and, uh, you know, that was my first real conscious thinking about death uh, on my own as, as a child. And I've never forgot that, that terror that, that I felt in realizing that there, you know, it, unless there's a way out of this death thing, that's what I'm destined for. Um, certainly, I was aware of, of the Bible and, and of God's plan, ultimate plan, which we'll get to later at that time. But uh, just thinking about that without God, you know, uh, that's that's what there is. It's just nothingness. And it's the best you can hope for is that your memory survives for a little while on planet Earth. That's the best you can hope for if, if uh, indeed there is no God. That's very depressing. So yeah. we're going to move to the scriptures now. Okay. And uh, the first scripture I'd like to look at is in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, because oftentimes you find major, major doctrines beginning in the book that's titled Beginning, Genesis. And uh, this doctrine is no exception, where it says, Then the Lord, Yahweh God, formed man of dust from the ground 
and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being or a living soul. Mm-hmm. So we, we seem to have an equation here. Mm-hmm. So we have the, the dust, right, and God forms that, and then he breathes into the nostrils that breath of life, and then you have a living being. So dust plus breath equals a living being, <laughs> if we could make a mathematical equation out of that. Mm-hmm. Um, so that seems to be the pattern given in the Bible, is that you have this sort of animated dust, and uh, that is a living soul. A soul is that whole thing combined, not just the invisible part. In Genesis 3.19, it says, By the sweat of your face you will eat bread. Now this is after the fall in the garden. This is the curse to the man, right? Mm-hmm. By the sweat of your face you will eat bread till you return to the ground. Because from it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. So it seems like God's not talking necessarily about Adam's body. But he's talking to Adam directly, saying, Adam, you will eat bread. You will return to the ground You are dust, and to dust you shall return. He's not just talking about Adam's body. He's he's, he's talking to Adam. And maybe that's a strange distinction, but all the time nowadays we hear about, um, especially in the the news, we hear about the body of so-and-so was found at this place, or, you know, when you have these various uh, crimes committed, they always talk about, well, where's the body? What's the evidence on the body, you know, especially in murder Mm -hmm. cases and so on? And nobody ever talks about the person. They're talking about the body because it's assumed that the person's somewhere else, and this is just a shell that's left over. But that's not how God addresses Adam. He doesn't say your body will return to the ground. But, you know, of course it will. He says you will return to the ground. Because you, not just your body, were taken from it. And you are dust, and you shall return to dust. And so what I'm getting at here is that God looks at us as whole persons, uh, not as split-up persons. You know, yes, there are different parts. You know, the body can be thought of as separate than the mind. I understand that. But is that a biblical distinction, or is that just a convenient way of us talking about things? Um, I think that would be the question. So, uh, another good verse in Genesis is Genesis 6.17, and uh, Genesis 6 is the chapter about the flood, which is uh, a type of the judgment to come in the end. And it says in verse 17, Behold, I, this is God speaking, even I am bringing the flood of water upon the earth to destroy all the flesh in which is the breath of life from under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall perish. And so, those who are living, and this is not just talking about humans, this is all the flesh, right? Those who are living have this mysterious breath of life within them. Mm -hmm. And that's what keeps them living. And then uh, chapter 7, verse 21 says, All flesh that moved on the earth perished, birds and cattle and beasts and every swarming thing that swarms upon the earth and all mankind. Of all that was on the dry land, all in whose nostrils was the breath of of the spirit of life died. And so the idea is that when you lose that breath of life that was breathed into the first man there, you're dead. You know, you cease to live. And uh, I think if we define death as the opposite of life, that would probably be the best way to look at it from a biblical standpoint. Uh... So let's keep going here. Job, which is also a very ancient book, um, which was possibly even written before Genesis was written, although Genesis records earlier events, Mm -hmm. says in 27.3, For as long as life is in me, and the breath of God is in my nostrils, my lips certainly will not speak unjustly, nor will my tongue mutter deceit. So the idea is that as long as we have this life breath in us, this mysterious, life-giving energy, or whatever it is. Um, And it's not any different than what's in animals. You know, I'm not talking about some sort of separable entity. If you separate the life of 
the, the breath of life from someone, they die. You know, it's not a separable thing, <laughs> if you understand what I'm saying there. Yeah. Um, uh, Ecclesiastes also speaks uh, about this as well. It says, High place and of terrors on the road. The almond tree blossoms, the grasshopper drags himself along, and the caper berry is ineffective. Uh, this is Ecclesiastes 12:5 to 7 For man goes to his eternal home, while mourners go about in the street. Remember him before the silver cord is broken, the golden in bro- bowl is crushed, and the pitcher by the well is shattered, and the wheel in the cistern is crushed. Verse 7, this is the punchline. Then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the breath, or spirit, as is translated in some translations, will return to God who gave it. And so it's not the immortal soul or something like that that returns to God. It's the spirit or the breath, the breath of life, returns to God. And that's just a metaphor for saying it. you breathe your last. You know, it exits your body and you return to dust. So that's our starting point. Wait, um, uh, let me ask a question. Yeah, sure. Sean, doesn't it say that the spirit goes back to he who gave it? The, it is okay are are we di- we're differentiating um between spirit soul and body is that right well that's kind of a, a tricky thing um yeah. what i'm talking about here is the breath of life right that was breathed into the first man and you, you see that thing happen each time a baby is born you know they take that first breath right. and they breathe in that air and out comes this scream, right? <laughs> this cry. Yeah. So, oh, you know, that, and that's a good sign. You know, that means things are going well. Um, and so that that first breath, you know, it, which which begins the uh, process of respiration and then continues that life, um, is is seen as something that, when it's taken away, causes death. Yeah. Um, so, what what I'm saying is not so much that this is something that it is it, not. Um, your, it's not your consciousness. I'm not talking about your consciousness. I'm talking about the thing that keeps your heart beating and your diaphragm going up and down and all that. Uh, the mysterious life-giving force, you know, whatever that would be, the breath of life. Right. And that's what I'm re- equating with spirit. Okay. Because the word for spirit is the word breath and wind. It's right. all the same word in Hebrew. Rosh? Ruach. Ruach. Okay. Yeah. So... Um, since it's all the same word, you know it's in, it's interchangeable. Now we'll get to um, we'll get to the the, the soul thing. Uh, when I was, it was kind of strange because when I was looking at these verses that talk about the soul, it seems that God refers to the person as the soul. You know, the the whole person is the soul, um, as opposed to just being a separable part of the of. Uh, the human body, or something like that. The, the soul leaves the body. You don't, you don't ever find that sort of language. You have the spirit leaving the body, but that's the breath life. Mm. Um, and the soul, it seems, it, it seems like the soul can die. Um, for example, in Genesis twelve thirteen, please say to though, please say that you, Abraham, talking to Sarah, say that you are my sister, so that I may go well with me because of you, and that my soul may live on account of you. And so the idea is that, you know, the soul could die, but he wants her to lie about who she, or at least be deceptive about who she is so that his soul may continue to live. The idea is that when he dies, his soul dies. Um, And when we do die, what happens is the man returns to dust. And there's so many scriptures that speak about that. But one of the best ones is Ecclesiastes 3.20, where it says, All go to the same place. All came from the dust, all return to the dust. So I guess that's that's my overall framework I want to start with before we really get into talking about uh, some of the other historical situations that developed with the idea of uh, life after death. Mm-hmm. Um, also, I don't know if you've ever noticed this, George Ann, but if you ever read through... Uh, especially First Kings and Second Kings and First Chronicles and Second Chronicles. If you read through Kings and Chronicles, almost every king, I mean, I, I, I haven't thoroughly checked this out uh, for every single king, but almost every king, at the end of it, it says something like this. 
This is First Kings 2.10. Then David slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David. It says something like that. You will lie down with your fathers, or he slept with his fathers. Uh, Solomon slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of his father David, and his son Rehoboam reigned in his place. That's First, first Kings 11.43. So all these kings, when they die, it, it says they slept with their fathers. Now, what in the world could that mean? Well, when uh, a king dies, what happens? They have a funeral of some sort, and they bury that king in the tomb of his fathers. And so the idea is that in this tomb are all these kings that are sleeping. And so the idea is that death is like sleeping in the grave. Um, and death involves no activity. No praising God, no thinking, no consciousness. And now that might sound a little strange, but uh, that's that's what the Bible is is telling us, though. In Second uh, Kings, it says uh, in chapter twenty-two, verse twenty: Therefore, behold, I will gather you to your fathers, and you will be gathered to your grave in peace, and your eyes will not see all the evil which I will bring on this place. So they brought back word to the king. So I, I think this is, um, if I have this right, it's Jehoshaphat. Um, or, no, not Jehoshaphat, Josiah. And uh, he's discovered this scroll, and, you know, he repents, and he, either him or Hezekiah. And, and the, the idea is that God's going to bring judgment on Israel, but it's not going to be after this king dies. And the encouraging or comforting word that God gives to the king is, You'll go to your grave in peace, and your eyes will not see the evil that I will bring on this place. So the, the idea is that judgment is still coming. Israel is still going to be judged by God through a pagan nation, but this king isn't going to know anything about it. Which implies to me that in the grave, people aren't looking down. They're not watching what's going on on earth, or else God would not have been able to make this promise that his eye would not see the evil which would, he would bring in this place. Uh, David, King David says in Psalms 6, 4, and 5, Return, O Yahweh, rescue my soul. Save me because of your loving kindness, for there is no mention of you in death. In Sheol, who will give you thanks? And so, in death, in Sheol, which is just a Greek word, or a Hebrew word for the grave, there's no one even giving God thanks. There's no praising God. You know, there's just, people are asleep. Um, Psalm 146.4 says, His breath departs, he returns to the earth, in that very day his thoughts perish. I mean, now that is a absolute slugger verse there. Yeah, it is. I should memorize that one. His, his breath departs, or his spirit or breath is the same word, departs. He returns to the earth. In that very day his thoughts perish. And by returns to the earth it means he is buried in, in the ground. And in that very day, his thoughts perish. Well, if you don't have any thoughts, you're basically unconscious. Right? Right. Um, I think that would be the definition of unconsciousness. No thoughts. No thinking. And so if death, if those who are dead are not thinking, they're not having any consciousness, then they have no perception of time. They're not, they're not, watching down on us or looking up at us from underneath the earth or something like that. They're just simply, as the atheist would say, dead. <laughs> Sometimes atheists have more honesty than us Christians, you know, on some of these doctrines. And, you know, you, there's always, like, uh, s such insight that children bring to theological, complicated things. Uh, you know, like you have a child at a uh, funeral home. Yeah. And uh, the child will go up there and say, well, Uncle Fred is in that casket. He's dead. Yeah. And there's so much truth to that. But no, it takes a, a very educated parent to say to that child, well, no, that's not really Uncle Fred. That's just the body of Uncle Fred. Uncle Fred's somewhere else. And the child probably furrows the brow a little bit and says, that sounds like nonsense to me. You know, <laughs> it sounds like that Santa Claus thing to me. It sounds like a fairy tale. What are you talking about? You know, <laughs> he's right there. You know, I know what Uncle Fred looks like. That's Uncle Fred. Yeah. He's right there. He's dead. He's asleep. He's not going anywhere. You know. 
And so I, I think that's the idea that's presented in Scripture. It's so simple, it's so easy to miss. Ecclesiastes 9.5 says, For the living know they will die, but the dead do not know anything, nor have they any longer a reward, for their memory is forgotten. Indeed, their love, their hate, their zeal have already perished. They will no longer have a share in all that is done under the sun. So we're talking about somebody who has... Their thoughts have perished. They, they know nothing. The King James puts it well. The dead know nothing. Right. Um, Ecclesiastes 9.10 is probably the biggest verse on this whole subject of what happens at death. It says, whatever your hands find... Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might, right? So if you're working uh, in a restaurant, you serve as best as you can those tables. If you're working as an architect, you you know, you do it with all your might, you know. Um, whatever it is you're doing, you do it with all your might. For there is no activity or planning or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you are going. And so that seems to clinch it for me. Uh, if if there's no activity, then nobody's worshiping God or, or doing. If there's no planning, then nobody's planning to polish rainbows or anything like that. Yeah. If there's no knowledge, then if you're alive, you're stupid. If there's no wisdom, then you know wouldn't even know what to do with that knowledge. And you know, I mean, just the whole concept of consciousness is incompatible with death. And I think an atheist or a little child can help us there sometimes to see that clearly. And so uh, Job is able to say something remarkable in Job 3.11. He says, why did I not die at birth? Now, that's a depressing thought, huh? I mean, he's, he's just, he's in the thick of such great despair that he says, why did I not die at birth? Come forth from the womb and expire. Verse 16, or like a miscarriage which is discarded, I would not be as infants that never saw light. And so the idea is, if he died he would not be he would cease to exist as 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 a miscarried child you know, someone that never saw light um that's what death is like you know it's just not existing um then uh he says for i know i would have lain down and been quiet i would have slept then i would have been at rest with kings with counselors of the earth who rebuilt ruins for themselves or with princes who had gold who were filling their houses with silver there the wicked cease from raging, there the weary are at rest, the prisoners are at ease together, they do not hear the voice of the taskmaster, the small and the greater there, and the slave is free from his master. In other words, everybody goes to the same place, to the to this realm of the dead, which in the Old Testament is called Sheol, or Sheol, I think is how you say that, and then in the New Testament is called Hades. Now, you will probably have some difficulty if you're reading from the King James at this point, because the King James translates both of those words as hell. And so you get the idea that everyone's going to hell when they die. But in fact, that's just a bad or poor translation, a poor way to render these words. A better translation is the grave or the realm of the dead or something like that. Yeah, the grave. Yeah, yeah the grave. I, I think that just makes better sense uh, all around. And the modern translations have been kind of sheepish about that. Uh, so what they do is instead of translating it the grave, they just leave the untranslated word there and to just sort of transliterate it into English. So instead of translating Sheol into grave, they just leave it there as Sheol. Uh -huh. And, you know, of course, nobody knows what the what Sheol is anyhow. And in the, in the New Testament, nobody knows what Hades is, right? So it, it gives the, the necessary wiggle room for theologians to do what they will with the understanding of the Bible there. At least that's my take on it. Maybe there's some noble reason that I'm not aware of. Uh, the other thing that's incredible is that souls can die. They are not indestructible. Ezekiel 18.4 says, Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. The soul who sins will die. And so souls can and do die. And God is telling us that the one who does wickedness, that soul or that person will die. Um... James 5.20 says, Let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. And so souls can die, which is why they need to be saved from death. Um, and, you know, there's there's just so many different verses, George, and I, I won't uh, belabor 
all these texts, but we have them on our, our site, uh, kingdomready.org. Uh, if you go to online resources uh, or online audio, uh, just click on uh, Death is Sleep, and you'll I've got a full list of them there. Um, John chapter 20 is remarkable because here we have um, the P- Peter, the disciple named Peter, Apostle Peter. He's running uh, at, along with the other disciple whom Jesus loved. Uh, they're running, and they, they say they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. But that's entirely incorrect if we're talking about a disembodied Jesus. Um, Jesus is his body, you know, and when he, he doesn't have the life breath of God in him, then he is Jesus is dead. Uh, when Jesus gets that life breath back, he's resurrected. He comes back to life. It's a very simple way of looking at it, and it makes best sense in light of the uh, biblical data. Um, Peter should have said they have taken away the body of the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have laid his body, but it doesn't say that. See what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, and then uh, the other verse there is right after it, John uh, twenty fourteen. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Now, in English, the word him is a personal pronoun, a third personal pronoun. And personal pronouns are words used to talk about persons, minds, egos, consciousnesses, not an empty body. And so she says, where is Jesus? Talking about his body. Where is Jesus? Uh, so she's not thinking of Jesus being off in heaven, and she's not just looking for the body. She's looking for the whole Jesus. Right. <laughs> um, Revelation one seventeen is probably the biggest verse in regards to the subject of Jesus and him dying uh, in regards to what happens when we die, because it says... Jesus speaking, he says, I am the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and of the grave. And so, Jesus said, I was dead. He didn't say my body was dead. He didn't say I was in heaven while my body was here for three days. He said, I was dead. And the only way the I can die is if his thoughts cease to exist, as we've seen from the Old Testament. So, What is the solution to death? There's uh, many different ideas posed. and It's kind of funny because I I went around the country, well, not the whole country, more like the Midwest and the Northeast, um, and we we went on a trip and we we ended up asking a lot of people, you know, what do you think happens in the afterlife? And it's remarkable because nobody said, except for maybe one or two atheists, well, when you die, you're you're dead. You cease to live. Everyone else, it doesn't matter if they were from India, from Israel, from America, from the north, from the south, uh, from Europe. It didn't matter where the person was from. They always said that the person continues to live after death in a disembodied fashion of some sort whether they were a Wiccan, which is like a modern-day witch, or if they were a Catholic, or if they were an agnostic, or if they were just a uh, Christian scientist or, or, or whatever, or a Scientologist. Whatever they were, they, they're all telling me the same thing. And I think that's so fascinating that the one thing that all these different religions and non-religions can agree on is is that at death, the consciousness continues on past the death of the body. And yet it's the Bible which teaches us that that is exactly false. Right. And so why is it that everyone is is believing this strange idea? Um, and so we have to take a look at a little bit of history in order to sort all that out. Um, but before I do that, I just want to quote from Warren Prestige on page 10 of his book, Life, Death, and Destiny, where he says, The most common solution to the problem of death, strangely enough, is denial. Yeah. And that's not a good solution, just denying that death 
happens, is it? Mm-hmm. He goes on to say, death is a universally observed fact, and yet it is very common for people to deny that death is what it seems to be, to deny that we really die. The claim is that the real person, or that which is ultimately important, does not die at all. Frequently, the human person is regarded as divisible into two quite separable parts. One is disposable, or even perhaps unreal, the body, which dies. The other is deathless, and it is this which really counts. This is the position of many religions and philosophies. For example, both Hinduism and Buddhism affirm the survival and reincarnation of what ultimately matters about us, whether it be the soul or a psychic factor. Um, and so it's just, I mean, have you ever come across this, George Ham? Well, yeah, most people will say, well, my God. Even non-Christians, I mean. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it seems like a universal thing. I mean, I'm just asking myself, who's teaching everyone? Because it's not natural. I mean, any any honest person will tell you that it's not natural to believe that the dead person is not really in the grave. They're really somewhere else. I mean, it's really quite a bizarre belief if you really put your mind to it, you know, that there's some sort of invisible person that exists sort of inside the body, operating it like a machine or something, that then escapes, and it's lighter than air, so like helium, it floats upwards until it, it goes into the, you know, higher realms of the pleroma or whatever. I mean, come on, that just sounds like... Somebody made that up personally, I don't know. Mm-hmm. But uh, I, I think it's so interesting because that's the most common solution to the problem of death. And that's not a good solution to say it doesn't really happen. Well, you know, Sean, people will point to, uh, oh, golly, uh, so-and-so saw their aunt and her their aunt died. Ah, and yes. They'll say, well, you know, if you go in the graveyard and you take a tape recorder with you, you can record the voices of the dead. Mm. Well, does anybody ever understand that a lot of times when, I shouldn't say a lot of times, and I'm not trying to be offensive, but sometimes people have uh, familiars, they have spirits in them that are not... uh, exactly good and those spirits can trick people right and they can talk they can make sounds they can manifest and even imitate that person's voice yes yeah this is a very ancient um biblical doctrine that there are familiar spirits as early as the time of saul the first king of israel uh around 1000 bc uh there there were people practicing the art of uh, bringing up the dead in a sense of using these familiar spirits. And, uh, you know, that that continues today, even on popular television. But I think it's so interesting that we have to leave the realm of the text of Scripture in order to put any doubt on the doctrine that dead people are asleep or unconscious in the grave. You know, why is it that within Scripture we can't find a differing viewpoint? Um, I, I think we need to stick to what the book says. If this book is really uh, divinely inspired by God, yeah. then it's God's word to us on this subject. And if we're going to take uh, somebody's experience over God's uh, written uh, instruction on that subject, I, I think we have to really examine our uh, our priorities. Mm-hmm. Um now, having said that, I think you're right. You know, there are ways to explain what it is that people are hearing. And I think a lot of it is probably uh, psychosomatic or, you know, in the sense that it's, it, somebody's in despair and they're they're conjuring up these thoughts. They already have a belief that dead people are floating around or disembodied on earth as ghosts, as the Wiccans and the Hollywood beliefs, um, that... Because of these beliefs that already exist in their mind in a state of great despair, they will hallucinate uh, or imagine, daydream, or have nightmares about these various things. Um, And I I think these things can all be explained uh, in in those ways. Not necessarily all natural explanations, because, you know, if there is a familiar spirit, that would be a supernatural explanation. Uh, But I think there are explanations as to why people have these alleged experiences. I've never had the experience of seeing a uh, dead person 
uh, floating around or something. And oftentimes, you know, I, I this one lady, she's the sweetest lady, but she just she she said, I saw my mother uh, after she was dead, and she you know she smiled at me or something like that. Yeah. And I said, well, what did, what did she look like? And she said, well. You know, she had this dress on, and you know, she had her hair, you know, done up, and she had these beads on, and I'm just like, well, isn't your mother's body in the grave? You know, why would she, why would she be in her body if she's not in her body? So if she's, what I'm saying is, if somebody's a disembodied soul, they're not allowed to have a body, so you can't see them as having a body. That's just cheating, you know. <laughs> so, uh, you know, either you see them as some sort of like energy or something like that, or you see them not at all. Uh, but don't see them in a body if their body is in a grave somewhere. You know, it just doesn't make sense to me. Um, so, so where did this idea come from? Um, and I looked up on JewishEncyclopedia.com, the immortality of the soul. Uh, it's by Kaufman Kohler, a very fine article, um, and he says. At the very top, the belief that the soul continues its existence after the dissolution of the body is a matter of philosophical or theological speculation rather than of simple faith and is accordingly nowhere expressly taught in Holy Scripture. That's incredible. The, let me say that again. The, I'll just read the beginning and the end of the sentence. The belief that the soul continues its existence after the dissolution of the body, is nowhere expressly taught in Holy Scripture. As long as the soul was conceived to be merely a breath, and inseparably connected, if not identified with the lifeblood, no real substance could be ascribed to it. As soon as the spirit or breath of God, which was believed to keep the body and soul together, both in man and beast, is taken away, as soon as that is taken away, or returns to God, the soul goes down to Sheol or Hades, there to lead a shadowy existence without life and consciousness. So this is what the Jewish encyclopedia is telling us, the original biblical belief on uh, the immortality of the soul. And the idea is that there isn't an immortality of the soul. The soul does perish. And then the question comes up, well, why would God design it like that? Why would God design people to expire? And I think the answer to that is, God didn't design us like that. That is a consequence of the fall. You know, because in the beginning, there was the tree of life. Not just the tree of knowledge of good and evil, there was also a tree of life. And it says specifically there that if the, they, they had to be expelled from the Garden of Eden, or else they would have eaten from the tree of life and have lived forever. And so where does living forever come from? It comes from something outside the person, this tree of life. Yes. Um, and then, uh, so the question is then, well, if the Bible, if Judaism uh, in, the, in the Hebrew Scriptures never teaches this idea of the immortality of the soul, why, why do Jews today believe that when somebody dies, their spirit goes off to heaven? And the answer to that is found here in the same article uh, from JewishEncyclopedia.com. And it says, The belief in the immortality of the soul came to the Jews from contact with Greek thought, chiefly through the philosophy of Plato, its princi princi uh, principal exponent, who was led to it through the Orphic and Eleusinian mysteries in which Babylonian and Egyptian views were strangely blended. And so the idea is that after the time of the Old Testament being written, you have this Greek philosophical idea coming into Judaism. And so, after Malachi had been written, there were other Jewish books that were written. Like, for example, the book of the Maccabees, or the book of um, uh, the various books from the Apocrypha, you know, Tobit and Judith and so on. Uh, these books, a lot of them do talk about the soul living on after death. But this was coincident with the time that the uh, Greek Empire had taken over essentially the whole Mediterranean world. And so, well, why does the Greek Empire matter? Um, well, 
Alexander the Great was the general in charge of the Greek Empire. You know, before it was an empire, it was just Greece. He's the one that did all this conquering. And what he would do is he would leave behind soldiers and scientists and philosophers and uh, other people, uh, engineers and so on, in each city that he conquered to establish Greek language, Greek culture, Greek ways of thinking. And he did this throughout the whole empire as he traveled. I mean, he traveled with quite an entourage. And he conquered the whole world. You know, the poor guy sat and wept at 33 because he had conquered the whole world. There was no more world to conquer. And uh, he ended up dying at a very young age because of that, in his 30s there. Um, or not because he didn't have any more world to conquer, because, he, you know, he got sick of something. I'm not sure what it was. But um, the idea is that he intentional you see now in the old days you would you would conquer somebody, subjugate them, make them pay taxes. You know. And then the idea came along, well let's let's take the people out of their land and relocate them and put other people in their land and this way nobody's gonna rise up in a foreign land and re- re- revolt. But if we leave them in their own land they might do that. Well Alexander was totally different. He converted the world to Greece. So that's how he was able to have such a, a extensive impact. Now, who was Alexander the Great's tutor? It was um, uh, Aristotle. Yeah. Who was Aristotle's tutor? Plato. And what was Plato was a homosexual. And he was he had. Go ahead, Sean. Well, my next thing was who was Plato's teacher? It was Socrates. Yeah. So we have Socrates to Plato to Aristotle to Alexander the Great, who conquered the world and established these Greek ideas of thinking at just the same time where we see this impact occurring in Judaism, so that now Jewish books that are being written, not scriptural books, but books nonetheless, um, are having this immortal soul idea starting to infiltrate, starting to come in there. And uh, so I think that's how we, we can trace the history of this idea within Judaism. Now, Christianity um, also, like Judaism, did not ever originally in the New Testament documents themselves contain the idea that people continue to live after they die. And the New Testament is very clear, as it, as it is in the um, Old Testament, that the solution to death is resurrection. And so in the New Testament, we find Jesus saying, Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and will come forth, those who did good deeds to a resurrection of life, those who committed the evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. Um, Jesus says repeatedly in John chapter 6 that he will raise his people up at the last day. Um, he says it over and over again. And Paul is, is magnificently clarifying for us in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20 to 23, where he says, But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. When? But each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, after that those who are Christ at His coming. And so, when does this resurrection occur? Not when the person dies, but when Jesus comes in the clouds with the voice to say, arise, to say, wake up, and then the dead will literally wake up, come back to life. Well, you know, it it doesn't make... It's too simple. I think that's what the problem is. You've got a good point, but you know, too, Sean, it doesn't make any sense that people would die and go to heaven, how are they going to be resurrected? What's the point of the resurrection of the dead right. if no one's really dead? Right. Exactly. And besides that, I mean, seriously, if if when someone dies, their soul leaves their body to this higher plane of existence in which one can travel at the speed of thought or whatever, you know, I'm just uh, speculating here. Why would you want to have to be re-imprisoned into your material body? Oh, Lord. Oh. I mean, if it's better, why would you... What's, what's the whole point of resurrection? Yeah. Uh, but now, if you don't do that, if you remain in the ground, if you remain unconscious in the ground, and God reanimates, miraculously re- reanimates that same body and brings it back to life, 
through resurrection. That is just the best solution you could ask for. Coming back to life and living forever. No worrying about the darkness that pervades um, and, and having nothing there to even see it. No observer. Instead, you have life forever on earth. You know, it, it seems that we were designed for that sort of thing, to live on earth. You know? uh, we weren't exactly given wings. Although I don't find any problem with getting in an airplane. But um, anyhow, uh, the other one is First Thessalonians 4, which is a very well-known scripture to us where Paul says in verse 13, we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep. And he's talking about dead people here. So that you will not grieve as do the rest of those who have no hope. So what's the hope for the believer? Uh, verse 15, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. And so the idea is that when Jesus comes, the dead come out of their graves. They are resurrected, brought back to life, out of their graves, and along with those who are alive at the time when he comes, we all meet up together in the air to escort Jesus to the earth. And Matthew 24 tells us that that occurs because the angels are sent out to bear us up, to carry us to our destination, which is kind of an interesting thought if you think about it. But that's Matthew uh, 24, 29 to 31, if uh, anyone out there is curious about that. Um, so wh where did this idea come into Christianity? Because Jesus didn't believe that dead people are alive. He, he believed that dead people are asleep. Um, in fact, Jesus said... Um, regarding Lazarus, he is asleep, and I go to wake him up. Right. And then, then the next breath, he says, Lazarus is dead. Clearly telling us that he equated the two. Um, so where did the idea, how did it come into Christianity? Well, um, according to, um, let me see which source I wanted to, okay, this one over here. Okay, according to what we can tell, Christianity was originally a Jewish movement. It was a movement within Judaism that believed Jesus was the Messiah. Specifically, it was a movement founded on the resurrection of Jesus as an example of what would happen to all of us in the consummation of the ages in the kingdom of God. And so, as Christianity developed and, and grew and came into new areas, they encountered the Roman Empire. They encountered the whole thought world of Rome. And interestingly enough, the Roman Empire adopted the, the Greek the culture of the Greek Empire, but just sort of renamed a bunch of things. Yeah. So we talk about the Greco Roman world. That's the, the world that was in Rome the Roman Empire, but it had this Greek Greek um culture behind it. And the although the official language of the Roman Empire was Latin, most people spoke Greek still. And so what you have then is Christians converting other uh, Greek-thinking Roman citizens and non -citizen, you know, people living in the Roman Empire to Christianity. And as the uh, religion continues to grow, what you have is this crisis where uh, you have two different world views colliding. And what ended up happening is as Christians converted these Greek-thinking um, people in especially Alexandria, Egypt, and in other areas of the empire, they, the people did not forsake their old pagan Greek belief system. They just added the Christian belief system to it. And so what you have then is you have the belief in the immortality of the soul, which was already there in place, in these unbelievers, and then they added to it the idea of resurrection. And that's where we are today in, in modern evangelical uh, Christianity and Catholicism and even uh, the Pro you know Protestant, Eastern Orthodox, and so on, um, is we have this idea that when somebody dies, immediately then there's a judgment where the person goes either to heaven or hell, and then eventually they get brought back to their body when Jesus comes. Of course, that doesn't make any sense, but it doesn't bother anyone because... Who cares if you're really in heaven anyhow? Um, but this, this whole thing came in through um, uh, Plato, 
or Socrates, Socrates actually said, I'll just back up for a second, to his students, fear not for Socrates, I'm paraphrasing, fear not for me, um, and don't say at my funeral, here lies Socrates, because I will not be there. Instead say, here lies the body of Socrates. And so that's the first time that we have you know, written accounts that I'm aware of where we have somebody saying, well, that's not me, that's my body. I'm somewhere else. And so that was developed by Plato in the allegory of the cave and so on, and, and Aristotle uh, brought that teaching, and Alexander the Great conquered the world, and there was this belief system out there that still pervades the world as we know it. Um, so let me just uh, quote to you from uh, another article. This is from the JewishEncyclopedia.com website as well. I mean, that's that's from the Jewish Encyclopedia, by the way. It's not just a you know, a knockoff website that some guy put together. I mean, it's a it's an official encyclopedia. Anyhow, it says that uh, in modern times, uh, the belief in the resurrection has been greatly shaken by natural philosophy. And the question has been raised by the reform rabbis and in rabbinical conferences whether the old liturgical formulas expressing the belief in the resurrection should not be so changed as to give clear expression to the hope of the immortality of the soul instead. And so... Modern uh, Jews are sort of like, well, you know, we still have this resurrection idea, but we don't really like it because none of us really believes in that anyhow. Let's just change the text so that it says immortality of the soul because that's what we really believe. Not the text of Scripture. I'm talking about their rabbinic liturgy that they would say in um, the synagogue and so on. Um, Another interesting uh, quotation is from the... um, Which point is this from? This is from the uh, International Standard Bible Encyclopedia that says, we are influenced always, more or less, by the Greek Platonic idea that the body dies, yet the soul is immortal. Such an idea is utterly contrary to the Israelite consciousness and is nowhere found in the Old Testament. That's uh, the article on death from the International um, Standard Bible Encyclopedia. Another one is uh, the Evangelical Dictionary of Theology, talks about origin and uh, how he was speculating about the soul in uh, the, the time after the apostles. And it says he was heavily influenced by Greek philosophy. And, and it's just so so works out that the ones who ended up winning the day, the form of Christianity that was the most popular and ended up producing what we call today the Antinocene Fathers, the, the writings of the Church Fathers that have come down to us, is this form of Christianity that believes that when somebody dies, their soul continues to live. However, that was not that way in the earliest Christianities. And there have always been Christians that hold to the the old view that death is the end of life until the resurrection. But now let me ask you this. If when somebody dies, their mind, their thoughts cease, their thoughts perish, according to the Bible. Um, do they, you know, do they have any perception of time at all? No. Okay, so if someone has no perception of time and a thousand years pass, how long would it seem to them? A blink of an eye. Just the blink of an eye. Yeah. I mean, it's, you, you probably use this robust technology when traveling on an airplane or in a long car ride, right? When somebody else is driving, you go to sleep and you wake up a moment later and look, we're almost there, you know? Uh, That's just as simple as it gets. So if you have someone who has died um, and, and they died today, and let's say Jesus came back tomorrow. Jesus is coming back tomorrow. Let's just say hypothetically. So somebody... Somebody died a thousand years ago, and somebody died today. Both of these people would have no awareness of time. And so from the perspective of the person himself, the moment he died, the next moment would be the resurrection. Well, the next moment he would have conscious awareness of right. would be his resurrection. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So it's not that we're saying you, you know you have to sort of stare into you know, the darkness for all these thousands of years until Jesus comes back. It's it's the next very moment. I mean, God is absolutely brilliant the way he sets things up. 
and this is just seems to be how he set up this particular thing. I'm trying to find this uh, quotation. I don't know if I can find it, but uh, it's by Justin Martyr. Uh, I don't know if you've ever come across it yourself. Oh, I think I found it. But you love it when you open up to a, the right page. This is page uh, 239 in the uh, Antinocene Fathers, uh, volume 1. It's, it says fo the following. Moreover, this is Justin Martyr, uh, about 145 A.D., somewhere around there. I pointed out to you that some who are called Christians but are godless, impious, heretics, teach doctrines that are in every way blasphemous, atheistical, and foolish. For if you have fallen in with some who are called Christians, but who do not admit this truth, and venture to blaspheme the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, who say there is no resurrection of the dead, and that their souls, when they die, are taken to heaven, do not imagine that they are Christians. Isn't that incredible? That even that early, um, or you, you hear that, there, or I should say, even that late in the game, uh, you know, Jesus, uh, his ministry was in the th early 30s or the late 20s A.D. So we're talking 150 A.D., 120 years later. Still, there is, the church has not yet embraced the Greek idea completely. I mean, here is Justin Martyr, who is a Greek philosopher, by the way, who converted to Christianity. And yet he was able to say that if there's somebody who says that when they die, their soul goes to heaven... You know, don't even think they're a Christian. Yeah. That's pretty radical. Now, Justin didn't lose all his Greek philosophy. You know, he still... Con he, he, you know, what you have is a syncretism, a combining of two religions. You know, instead of changing the worldview completely, what you do is you add Christian uh, things, Christian elements to your existing worldview. Um, and that seems to be what happened, historically speaking. I mean, I'm certainly no expert on the, the history of dogma, uh, but... Uh, there, there seems to be something that happened in those early days because any, any honest or even atheistical uh, uh, scholar uh, will tell you that the Bible teaches that dead people are asleep until the resurrection. Right. They will all tell you that. So where, where did this change? You know, that's really the major question that we have. We know, we know who was thinking about it. We just don't know exactly how it entered the Christian uh, worldview. Um, but we, we know that by the year 200, these, these thoughts were basically uh, set in stone. Uh, Warren Prestige says it like this in page 11 of his book. Under the immense influence of Greek philosophy disseminated throughout the Mediterranean and Near East following the conquest of Alexander the Great, some non-biblical Jewish writings of the period before Christ accepted the soul's immortality. Under the same influence, the doctrine eventually prevailed in the Christian tr tradition, it was entrenched as Catholic dogma by the Fifth Lateran Council, which is 1512 uh, to 1517 A.D. And although the Protestant reformer Martin Luther ridiculed the dogma and many radical Christian groups opposed it, from Calvin onwards it was assumed in the post-Reformation Protestantism to be a part of Christian doctrine. And so what we have is an idea that gets into Christianity from outside the Bible that conflicts with the Bible and instead of rejecting it, what we do is we just sort of mold what the Bible does teach a little bit and mold what Plato teaches a little bit and sort of make this soft, mushy compromise that allows both to be there. And what we get instead is this idea that when you die, your soul goes off to heaven and then it comes back to your body. You know, so it's like a, a ping pong ball or something. I'm not really sure. Uh, so it, it's just fascinating to come across so many people uh and you know you can do this yourself um just ask people you know i was i was listening to the bite show and this radical nutso guy was talking about death and he was saying that dead people are just asleep until the resurrection what do you think about that and ask somebody that question and see what they'll say they'll say well that's preposterous of course when you die your soul continues to live everybody knows that so where'd you get that idea from? I guarantee you they will not quote to you a verse out of the Bible. That's right. Um, and the reason why they won't is because it's it's not in the Bible. Now, there are some verses that have been used to teach that um, this is a 
reality that when you die, you, your soul does continue to live. And we can address those on another bite show okay. um, at some point, you know, if, if there's an interest in that. Because, you know, there there are verses that can be twisted to mean that. Yeah. But if you just take the Bible as a whole, start in Genesis and work your way straight through, you're going to come across this idea of repeated and repeated over and over again that dead people are asleep in the grave until the resurrection, which is the miraculous solution of God for the whole problem of death that we face uh, in this uh, this life that we live. That's right. There's we yeah we should do a part two on this because there is a lot more to this, a lot more material, and it is. Sean, some of the new age stuff out there is just absolutely mind boggling, and people actually believe it, and it oh my, you know. So I think there's a lot of things that need to be set straight and uh, myths, as it were, uh, to be dispelled totally because it's it's important. And we are coming up on a time when uh, living on this planet is getting more and more tenuous by the hour. <laughs> you know, that's a good way to put it. Sure. Yeah. So give out your information, Sean, how people can get a hold of you. Sure. Uh, my email is sean at kingdomready.org, S-E-A-N, kingdomready.org. And uh, my number here at the church is 518-785-8888. Um, we have a number of resources on this subject on our website, uh, kingdomready.org. Um, and you can just click on resources. Uh, the first thing up is comprehensive studies. We have a comprehensive study on what happens when people die, including uh, several audio files, which are all free downloads, and several articles, and then several video files. So um, if anyone's interested in looking into it more, you can start there. Um, or uh, just, just hit the books and, and look up this stuff in the encyclopedias. It's all right there. You know, there's, this is, there's nothing secret here um, about this belief. And the best place, of course, to start is, is the Bible itself. Right. That's exactly true. Well, by golly, we will be back with a part two on this topic. And uh, this is George Ann Hughes with Sean Finnegan signing off for tonight. God bless you, Sean, and your family and everyone out there that is listening and paying attention because this is for those with ears to hear and believe me we have a lot of listeners out there with ears to hear and a special hello to Croatia we have listeners there that have come on board God bless you and good night everybody